I am delighted to see everybody here. For those of you who may not know me, I'm Alice Bach. I'm the director of the Hallinan Project for Peace and Social Justice here at Case Western Reserve. Continuing with our mission, it is my pleasure to bring Allison Weir, founder and executive director of If Americans Knew, to our campus today to discuss media coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Specifically, this vital organization's objective is to provide information that is to a large degree missing from American press coverage of this critical region. And I will turn this over to Alison Weir. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I don't happen to be Jewish or Palestinian or Muslim or Arab. And so, like most Americans, originally I paid very little attention to this issue. In fact, I knew almost nothing about Israel and Palestine eight years ago. I was the editor of a small newspaper in Northern California, writing about the city council, the school district, the local fishing fleet. Like most Americans, I skimmed the headlines on this very important issue. I accepted the confusion that I found there, and I moved on. I'll be giving about 100 years of history in a few minutes, and I'll sadly leave out far more than I can put in. Um, on our website, we have much more detailed information and many book recommended books. But just to give you a sketch, because I did not know what was going on when I started my search, and what I thought I knew was really incorrect. The first thing that I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. It did not exist. There was Palestine, a region that had, had been around, of course, for many centuries. And that, so the question is, if, if Israel didn't exist when I was born, where did Israel come from and where did this conflict come from? To answer that question, you don't go back a thousand years or two thousand years or whatever. You just go back uh, to the late 1800s and you find that Palestine was under the Ottoman Empire. It was a multicultural land, about 80% Muslim, 15% Christian, 5% Jewish, all living on the land, all practicing their religions fairly harmoniously uh, without significant conflict at all. So what happened to this land? You don't change places chronologically, but you do geographically. And you discover that if you go to Europe, there was a movement in Europe that started in the late 1800s called political Zionism that developed a wonderful shining slogan, a land without people for a people without land. Zionism, political Zionism in particular, was the belief that there needed to be a Jewish state somewhere in the world. They considered Uganda, Argentina, they considered parts of North America for the Jewish state, and eventually they settled on Palestine because of biblical connections from 2,000 years before. Now, if you'll think of that slogan, a land without people for a people without land that I grew up with, it sounds wonderful. We, I think we would endorse that, except it was not a land without people. It was fully inhabited. Uh, one of the early Zionists that came wrote back to his uh, family back in Europe about what he had found, Palestine. He, you know, the simile was to a bride. And he said, I, I have seen the bride. She is beautiful, but she is married. So sadly, nevertheless, the immigration continued by Zionists to Palestine to create a Jewish state. And as we know, indigenous populations do not, especially over time, welcome their colonists with open arms, especially as the colonists increase in number and as it becomes clear that the intention is to dispossess 95% of the people who are already there. As a result, there was the tragic but predictable violence with innocent lives lost then as now on both sides, then as now the vast majority of them, the Palestinian Christians and Muslims. The immigration continued and the violence continued over the decades, jumping ahead now to 1947, 
After World War II, the British had taken over uh, the mandate from the Ottomans after World War I. After World War II, the British finally, with all the violence between the two groups and against the British Empire as well, decided to turn over the question of Palestine to the United Nations to solve. The United Nations at this point had the option of affirming a bedrock principle of democracy and of the United Nations itself, which was self-determination of peoples. Or they could revert to the medieval version where someone, an entity, gives someone else's land away, divides it in half. Well, sadly, I believe for the world and for everyone, the United Nations, rather than affirming self-determination of peoples in which the people there would decide their own land, their own government, their own country, etc., they decided to recommend a partition plan in which half of it would be given to a Jewish state and half of it to a Palestinian Christian and Muslim state. Well, apart from it being coerced from an outside agency, not self-determination, let us examine this compromise solution to this conflict. Sometimes compromises are necessary. That's reality. But when you examine this one, you discover, first of all, it wasn't half. It wasn't 50-50. It was that one side was getting 55% and the other 45%. And the group that was getting 55% was not the group that had lived there for centuries and had originally been 95% of the population. It was the group, the newly arrived group. So the Jewish state was going to get 55%. To me, this made no sense. So I wondered, I knew that there was a lot of immigration. It had increased in numbers over the years, especially under the Nazi atrocities. So I thought, well, maybe they had become 55% of the population, and perhaps it was a rational kind of compromise. Well, you look at the numbers, the increase, the immigration had caused a massive increase in population size, but it was still only 30%. So the group that was 30% was getting over half. That didn't make sense to me, so I wondered, well, perhaps it's land ownership. Land ownership could be a rational approach. Uh, this, in some cases, had been a well-funded immigration. The Rothschild banking family, in some cases, had funded some of this, these efforts. The intention had been to dispossess the people through just buying up all the land and pushing them that, that way. So maybe they had succeeded, and they owned 55% of the land. Well, the land ownership, the Jewish land ownership, had gone up significantly. Originally, it was around 1%. It was a very urban population. It had gone up to, at most, it appears, about 8%. Most historians say 5 to 6%. So a group that, let us say, owned 8% of the land was being given 55% of the land. I think, as history has shown us, the more inequitable the more unjust a situation is, the more violence that results, not, not the reverse. So rather than leading to more peace, it led to more violence. Let's see what's... And there was an outright war, the War of 47 to 49. Um, this war is called in Israel the War of Independence. To Palestinians and most of the region, it's called the catastrophe, al-Nakba, because it was a massive humanitarian catastrophe in which at least three-quarters of a million human beings, it was probably, it's quite the uh, UN, I believe, or the British, it's, some people say it was 800,000. It may have been even higher than that. At least three-quarters, pretty much of the entire Palestinian population was forced off their land, violently forced through extremely violent means, including a number of massacres. Much of this violence, and I believe half the massacres, occurred before Israel had even declared independence. So the myth, if any of you grew up with the myth of five Arab armies besieging little Israel, uh, may not know that a great deal of the ethnic cleansing occurred before a single Arab army had joined the conflict and that even once the Arab armies joined the conflict, the force of the Arab and Palestinian forces were smaller in number and in weaponry, considerably smaller, than the Zionist Israeli forces were. So there was a massive, what the Israeli historian Ilan Pape has called, ethnic cleansing. That really is the, the accurate term for what happened. 
These refugees, according to international law and according to international morality, have the right to return home. But Israel does not allow them to return to their homes. So this is one of the key factors in the conflict today, and it's a factor the U.S. media almost never talks about, but it's significant. Again, jumping ahead to here some of the massacres during this period. Uh, to 1967, we find that Israel attacked, at the end of that war, Israel had conquered 78% of Palestine, so the Palestinians were down to 22%. Then in 1967, Israel again attacked its neighbors, as it did in every single war except for one. And in this case, they conquered the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and the Gaza Strip. These are occupied territories. They are not part of Israel, except for Israel decided to annex the Golan Heights. Uh, the people there don't agree to that, but that's what Israel did. The West Bank and Gaza Strip are occupied territories. They are not part of Israel. They are Palestinian territories. During this period, by the way, Israeli forces, this was the Six-Day War, also attacked a U.S. Navy ship operating in international waters, the USS Liberty. They killed 34 American servicemen, injured 174 of them. The decks were running with blood. This was, according to Admiral Thomas Moore, a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, this was an act of war by the State of Israel against the United States of America. And this was an act of murder against American servicemen. Again, according to Admiral Thomas Moore, testifying on Capitol Hill, I believe it was in 2003, I was there. Highly significant testimony not reported in the American media. If you look on, your web, on our website, you will see it's in the congressional record. An op-ed by Admiral Moore was in the Stars and Stripes newspaper. And the Associated Press uncharacteristically actually did a story about that. Nevertheless, do a LexisNexis search and you just don't find, you know, something like 10 newspapers out of hundreds reported anything to do with it. Since 1967, by the way, taking land by conquest is no longer legal under international law in today's world. In addition, moving your population onto that land, confiscating private land, kicking the people out, and putting your own population on is illegal. There is no doubt about this. And yet that is what Israel has been doing since 1967. Every single one of those red dots is an illegal Israeli colony on Palestinian land. The red dots in Gaza have been removed as they were required to be removed by international law. So those are no longer there. Instead, Gaza is just largely a prison. Um, Israel controls the borders, the airspace, etc. So it no longer has those red dots. It's just one big prison. But the West Bank now increasingly, while those settlers were taken out of Gaza, the number of, the amount of land taken in the West Bank increased significantly, and the number of settlers that moved onto that land increased significantly. That also was not reported by our media. So there is a lot of context that is extremely important to know that our news media aren't telling us. When I began to look into this, this was all new to me back in 2001. I had not known this was going on. When I began to look into it more and more, it, after several months, it seemed to me that this was so significant that it seemed to me that if what I was starting to learn was true, then, then it appeared that our national interests and needs as a nation were the opposite of what we were being told, and our moral responsibilities as human beings were the opposite of what the media were leading us to believe. It seemed so important that I finally decided to quit my job and to go and see for myself. And so began the most unusual trip I've ever undertaken. Many years before, I had been in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. In that case, I was taught the language, I was married, and I had a very official support system behind me, the Peace Corps. In this case, I was going to be traveling alone, and I had no support system whatsoever of any kind. Uh, as I landed on February 7th at 8 p.m., my return flight scheduled for one month later, I experienced a sudden pang of the disquiet I had been trying to ignore. 
What was it going to be like for me as an American female to wander alone through a Muslim land that was in the middle of a violent uprising and that was at the very epicenter of a region portrayed wide, widely as extremely hostile to women in general and to Americans in particular. What was it going to be like? Well, as I wandered haphazardly and randomly throughout the Palestinian territories, throughout the West Bank and Gaza Strip, I discovered that once again, these are more myths about this region that are as untrue as they are widely held. I was welcomed and invited to stay in people's homes. I was treated with respect and completely safe, except when I came too near the Israeli military. I was welcomed whenever people heard that I was an American. The invariable response was welcome. And yet, this is what our media show us. Now they should, all of these pictures I'm showing you, I took myself, including these. Uh, this is what we see in our media that consistently reinforces Palestinians as terrorists, frightening images to us. If you look at this picture, sadly, I think I must have ruined the photograph that these photojournalists were taken, taking because I was taking these pictures myself. This is a cardboard box that was being burned in what looks frightening in a in a funeral for a small boy who had been killed the day before. Now, yes, we should see these. I took them. I'm showing them to you. But it seems to me we should also see what most of the people looked like in that funeral. And this is what they looked like. This girl said to me, do you think we're all terrorists? Because Palestinians know that's what Americans are led to believe about them. It seems to me we should see that there are, of course, still Christian Palestinians living there. You can meet them easily and ask them questions, as I did. I interviewed many, many people. That was my whole purpose of my trip. They all told me we are all Palestinians being pushed out by Israel. Muslims and Christians were just Palestinians. In this funeral, these were mixed. They're always mixed. Friends, you know, friends working together, etc. Uh, this little boy, George, that was their son, he's holding a fragment of the missile that came through their home. His mother said he doesn't like his home anymore, and I understand why not. It's full of bullet holes. He's afraid to live there anymore. During my month of traveling throughout the Palestinian territories, I had found a population under siege. Throughout Gaza and the West Bank, I found that there were people were being kept virtually in prison. There were military checkpoints that limited and sometimes totally prevented you from leaving your town and going to the next town over. There were people living just outside, there were teenagers, living just outside the incredible city, the religious and cultural center of that region, Jerusalem, who had never been in there. It's like having teenagers that are just outside of Cleveland that have never been into Cleveland because they're not allowed to in. They're the wrong kind of people, and they're not allowed in. And by checkpoints, I don't mean toll booths or something. I mean armed soldiers in combat gear. In Gaza, I grew used to almost arriving at a street corner and finding young soldiers in tanks with fixed machine guns aimed straight at you. You hoped they waved you on rather than shooting you, as they had some people. At night, you couldn't really see the soldiers very well, but you saw the, the flashlight with which they signaled whether or not you were allowed to continue driving, to continue living. This was routine. But in some parts, there was more. It's sort of like here, some parts are less desirable areas to live in than others. In Palestine, they're being shelled, sometimes nightly. This is still going on. Um, I went through residential areas that were bullet riddled with homes with large holes through the roofs and the walls. Uh, I found that if the people were lucky, they had abandoned their homes. They only lost their home that was their shelter in old age. Uh, they had somewhere else to go. Many people, I discovered, were still living in these homes. They had mattresses in the center or someplace that they hoped was less likely to sustain a direct hit that would kill them and their children. As I was being shown around this area, people were coming up to me and smiling at me over and over. They were welcoming me to Palestine. And they were taking me to show me their homes. Children were bringing me 
When they saw that I was curious about all the spent bullets around, they were bringing them to me by the handfuls. And as I was going around this area and people were welcoming me and smiling at me and I was seeing Swiss cheese homes, suddenly there was more gunfire right near me. It wasn't whizzy. We, we ducked and they took me out the sort of safe way out of their home and away from the gunfire. As I wrote in an email later, I didn't think this, these bullets had anything to do with me. It was just a coincidence. Well, later and still, I don't think that was a correct assessment. As I was going around this area, this was the Tufa area of Khan Yunus in Gaza. As I was going around it, I occasionally peeked over sandbag barricades, or very carefully, I promise you, through slits in the shutters, and I could see the Israeli guard towers there overlooking us. I have no doubt that the Israeli soldiers saw that a foreigner was going around, and they finally decided to send her a message. Don't come here. Don't come to Palestine. Don't tell Americans how their money is being used. This would have fit their pattern. Again, the American media don't tell us that, but Israeli forces shoot, injure, and occasionally kill journalists all the time. Now, they're usually Palestinian journalists. Maybe our media just don't think they count. But some have been German, Italian, British, American. We just don't hear about them. One was a 26-year-old American correspondent for AP. She was shot in the abdomen. It destroyed her spleen and her uterus. I learned this from a British photographer in Gaza. I was skeptical. I'd never heard about that. Well. It turned out he was, he was right. I looked into it. In fact, I even read later that uh, the Israeli, Israeli military had admitted that she was an American, and they, they court-martialed the soldier who had done it. Now, he has another job, and she has an abdomen missing a spleen and a uterus. If this had been done by Palestinians, it would have been headlines. Why didn't we read about it? In Gaza, I saw beautiful agricultural lands being destroyed. I saw ancient olive groves uprooted. I saw, an ancient, I saw 100-year-old date palms next to the sea that had been flattened. I talked to farmers who had farmed there forever, their fathers, their great-grandfathers, their great-great, going back sometimes 19 generations or more had farmed that land, and now they were destroyed. I wondered, what would they do now? How do you feed your family when your farm is destroyed? It occurred to me that when and if they were allowed out of Gaza, and they haven't been, and this was back in 2001, maybe they would join the mass of Palestinian day laborers at some point. This is what I saw in Gaza along the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea. I saw a people and a land being destroyed. To me, this is newsworthy. I talked to people who were, at this time, at five months, had been out of work, were the only ones still working for an extended family of 40. Of course, it's far worse now than it was then, as I just saw in my most recent trip. We're used to, as Americans, we're somewhat used to seeing images of third world poverty. I think we're troubled by them, but we tend to think there's so much. What can we do? This is not what I was seeing in Palestine. I was seeing intentionally created poverty through the use of my tax money. I talked to women living in tin shanties and tents in the dirt. They had had homes. One woman had had two homes. She had just bought one for her son who had just gotten married. Both homes had been destroyed by Israel. The international community in its generosity had provided her a tent without a floor. So I sat with her in the dirt and Palestinians are almost invariably welcoming, gracious hosts. She gave me sweet mint tea and asked me to tell Americans about them. And I told them I would try, and here I am. And I saw more. I don't like seeing suffering. I don't like seeing children in pain. But if I wanted to know what was going on in Palestine, and since thousands of Palestinian children have been injured through the use of my tax money, then I needed to see that, and they're not hard to find. I just went to the nearest hospital, as I did recently again. You see children with bullets in their back, in their stomach, in their teeth, in their head. I saw a brain-dead 12-year-old. His crime had been throwing stones 
at tank-wielding soldiers. I saw children who will never walk again. Their childhoods are finished. They won't skip, they won't frolic, that's it. I saw parents who were happy to see me. They thought that as an American, perhaps I could bring help for their poor, destroyed children. I asked the doctor if perhaps there was help that could be provided in the U.S. Maybe a doctor could be flown in, or maybe the children could be flown to the U.S. And the, the doctor told me in front of the parents they didn't speak English. He said he hadn't yet found the right way to tell the parents, but that their son was totally and eternally paralyzed. And so I knew something they didn't know, and I wished I didn't. And now you do too. And this is what I saw in Gaza. And then I went to Ramallah. I visited a newspaper office where there were sandbags against the bullets that Israel shot at them. At one point I was sitting writing a news story that, of course, was never published anyway. And I, they pulled the curtain aside and showed me a bullet hole right at head level next to where I was writing. And, and we all laughed at this sign of violence and danger. When I first arrived at this newspaper office, they said, a nine-year-old boy was just shot nearby. Maybe you'd like to go see. And again, I thought, no, I wouldn't like to go see. But I was there for all of us, and I went. And I took pictures of the blood going up to his home. I interviewed the student in the floor below who told me what had happened. Uh, two men had had some sort of dispute down below in the street. One had fired two or three shots. And then the Israeli military in front of the Israeli colony, overlooking at us, us had let loose 10 to 15 minutes of heavy firing, high velocity projectiles at this condominium full of families at this residential neighborhood. And one of the bullets had killed the little boy upstairs. I went up there and I saw where he had been sitting watching his father paint the wall. I saw the toy trucks on the bed, the blood on the floor. I saw the wall hanging in the living room that had a bullet hole in it that said in English, thinking of God makes our hearts grow calm. I saw the needle point over the front door that said, God bless our home. The family had moved in 10 days before, I was told. I saw the flowers in the living room, the family photos on the wall, and I saw the parents when they returned from the hospital. I heard the mother and sisters weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. I saw the father walking around shell-shocked. It looked to me like he was in a bad dream that will never end. I saw the neighbors come in to try to comfort them. I heard one man, when it looked like the father was about to break down, tell the father, your son is a bird in heaven now. The next day I went to the funeral and the next day I went to another one. There are so many funerals to go to. This one was for a woman who had, been, who had three children, 18, 14, and 12. She had been coming home from the market, and she had been killed. At one point, I found myself walking next to a woman who it turned out was the dead woman's neighbor. She told me that this woman had gotten a master's degree in American literature, I think at Iowa, she told me that her friend just a few days before had been asking about what it was like to go to college in America because her 18-year-old son had been asking her what's it like to go to college. He wanted to go to college in America. And this woman told me it's every boy's dream in Palestine to go to college in America. But she said he won't go now. He'll stay home to help with his brothers. And this is what I saw in Ramallah. And then I went to Bethlehem where I saw an infinite he was in a hospital and his mother hadn't been allowed to visit him for months, her sick baby, because she wasn't allowed out of Gaza to visit her baby. And I saw one home after another that had been destroyed and pictures of children that had been in those homes, foolish children, and had been killed. And I remembered going around Rafa in southern Gaza and seeing the destroyed homes there. And I remembered sitting with a family whose son had been a, had owned a second-hand shoe store, and they had told me how he had been killed when he had his key in the lock 
getting ready to open it for the day or close it. I'm not sure which it had been. And I remember talking with another family nearby in Rafa, and they asked me why Israel was doing this to them, why America was doing this to them. And I found it hard to answer their questions because I was so tired of telling people, Americans don't even know what we're doing to you. Our media don't tell us. And as I left and they waved goodbye, there was more gunfire all around. And the gunfire was coming from one direction only, the Israeli direction, as in every situation I witnessed on that trip. The only time that I saw guns, Palestinian guns, that were about to be used for something other than signaling grief in funerals, or bravado, was in another part of Rafah at a sandbag barricade when Israeli armored vehicles were starting to move in, and tanks. And then I noticed a, a crowd of boys and men were starting to gather to throw stones against those armored vehicles. And I didn't take any pictures on that trip of Israeli soldiers and tanks. It seemed unsafe to do that, especially for the people around me. So I didn't take those photographs. And then these three young men, I noticed there were three young men that had guns. And they asked me not to take their photographs. So I didn't take that photo either. But I wish I had that photo to show you, and I wish I had pictures of the Israeli armored vehicles. And then you could decide about these young men, how foolish they were, or courageous, or brave, or suicidal, or patriotic. I don't know. And maybe you can tell me why we need to keep buying their conquerors new and bigger weapons and then explain this to me. And this is a little of what I saw in Palestine. But it's not what I saw when I came back to the US. I went to the, the library in Sausalito, and I took out every San Francisco Chronicle that had been published during the, the period I was there. And as I sat in the library that day, I had the pile of newspapers. I wrote down a synopsis, the headline and the synopsis of what each newspaper contained. And as I sat there, I was appalled at what had been considered news coverage. I saw headline after headline after an Israel under siege. I had spent two or three days in Israel. I had gone to, I had taken crowded buses, taxis, I joined throngs of shoppers, I had sipped a cappuccino at a cafe. And I had thought about what was going on just out of sight, just a little ways away. I noticed that although the Chronicle didn't have room for the story about nine-year-old Obai who had been killed or paralyzed children or women drinking tea in the dirt, but I noticed that on the very day that Obai had been killed, nine years old, that the Chronicle did have room and did publish a very long story about children who had tragically been killed over 50 years before in a Holocaust that it is too late for the world to prevent instead of telling us about what is going on now that we, if we chose to, could stop. One time while I was in Gaza, not staying with families the way I often did, I was in a hotel room and I sat down to write another news report about what I'd seen that day that I now know wouldn't have been published anyway. But instead of writing a news report, I found myself writing a letter to Americans back home. I'll read it to you now. Come to Palestine and see how your tax dollars are spent. Visit a hospital with me and see a boy with a bullet hole in his back. See children with scared eyes and legs that don't work anymore. A terrified old man whose neck is swathed in bandages from the bullet that passed through it as he sat in his home drinking his tea. Come with me and visit mothers of dead, injured, gone children, thousands of them and tell them how you didn't know we supplied the weapons that ripped flesh, broke bones, destroyed lives, destroyed lives. Talk to old women who are made to kowtow to uzi-toting 19-year-olds who tell them, no, you can't go to visit your son today. No, you can't take a drive in the country. No, you can't go to the hospital and have your chemotherapy, your dialysis, your operation, and watch as they die. 
Come to the borders with me, invisible lines in the sand between towns that Israel has drawn with its tanks and helicopters and 200 nuclear weapons. And watch the women with difficult births deliver dead babies and then die themselves at military checkpoints, death points, when soldiers with their ultimate power decide not to let them pass. Listen to these young warriors with their lethal weapons and deadly tempers proclaim, We've decided to close this road, and if you don't like it, we'll shoot you, as we already have 10,000 of your countrymen. Don't look at us wrong, or we'll shoot out your eyes, as we have 28 of your children. We're not cruel. We left 27 of them with one eye. Go, har go home, Arab, and wait, and pray we don't decide to shell it, as we have thousands of those others who were in our way with the wonderful singing missiles the U.S. gives us. Go harvest your crops, Arab, until we decide to bulldoze your 100-year-old date palms and ancient olive groves, your strawberry fields forever gone. Come to Palestine, Americans, and see your tax dollars at work, millions and millions of them, every day, every day. And weep with me for our victims and our guilt, and then say, no more. Thank you.